Hi guys and welcome back. In this video I'm going to move on to the bricks of my kit Trans Am. So they all worked when I first got the car but I wanted to complete new setup. So I bought new brake pads, new brake rotors for the front disc brakes and also complete new uh, setup for the, the rear drum brakes. So new brake shoes and a complete new spring kit for the rear drum brakes. Of course I also bought new brake hoses for all around the car and later on in the project I even replaced the uh, metal brake lines because one of the brake lines was rusted out after the car came back from the, the paint job so I had to replace those also. Let's start with the brake hoses and brake lines. The third gens come with five brake lines. One per front wheel going from the master cylinder to the respective wheel connected then to the brake caliper with their hoses. Then there's the center brake line that goes from the brake cylinder all the way to the back of the car connected to the two rear axle mounted uh, brake lines by the center brake hose. And then the rear axle mounted brake lines go directly into the wheel cylinder in the drum brakes. So since I can't bend brake lines myself, I just bought a complete new set of those five brake lines from uh, fbodywarehouse.com. So I bought them back in July 2019 and just recently checking on their website, they don't seem to be available, at least not on the website. So maybe if you call them or email them, they are still available, but you can also buy them on uh, Hawks Motorsports. So once I got the complete set of five brake lines, I primed and painted them before I installed them. And the only thing I didn't replace is the, the long, the middle one, because it was in perfect condition on my car. And since it had been undercoated and painted over with the rest of the, the, the underbody, I didn't really see any, any sense in changing that one too. So I just changed the two front ones and the two back ones. And that was it. It's actually quite easy to do that. I mean, basically just follow follow the line from the master cylinder up to the end of them and just have some water handy in a spray bottle just in case some uh, leftover brake fluid comes out and could damage either your fingers, your skin or any paint that the uh, brake fluid might drop on. Now, why didn't I go the route of upgrading the entire braking systems? I mean, I did a stock restoration on that, which is fine. The brakes are good, but they're not really that good. I mean, come on, given the age of the car and the technology back then. But I actually would like to do a video on that subject a little bit later down the line when I go into the different upgrading possibilities of the braking system and the suspension, everything that goes with it. Let's start with the drum brakes. I had never worked on drum brakes ever in my life before, so it did take me a bit of time to figure things out, but it's actually not that difficult. Here is how it proceeded. Obviously, I had the car in jack stands and the handbrake released. Once I've removed the drums, I cleaned them up and painted them also, just like explained in the suspension restoration part. It's easy to take drum brakes apart. Just start unhooking one of the springs somewhere and work your way through. Putting everything back together properly is the tricky bit. The biggest advice I can give you is to take pictures of every angle of the drum brakes when it's all together. This way you can then print them out and keep them next to yourself while you take the drum brakes apart. Or should I say once you put everything back together. One other top tip is to wear eye protection because with all these different springs, one of them can easily spring into your eyes and I mean create bigger injuries. So be smart, wear eye protection and you'll be all set.
the brake shoes and all of the springs and all of those parts are removed, you can take care of removing the wheel cinders. And the wheel cinder is actually just held in place by a spring on the other side of the wheel cylinder, on the side of the, the brake line. So you just pop in a small screwdriver and you can unclip this clip, well, you can un un unpop it from both sides. Now all you have to do is to unbolt the brake line from the wheel cylinder and then you can remove the wheel cylinder and put the new one in and reconnect everything. Now the tricky part is to press the retaining clip back into the wheel cylinder. So in order to do that, to be able to press in and not to push the wheel cylinder back out, I actually used a nut, a ratchet nut that I placed between the uh, new wheel cylinder and the hub of the wheel. So I could actually press in the, the clip in, uh, into position with the screwdriver. It's, it's quite tricky because you have to actually put quite a lot of pressure onto the clip to really go into the grooves and clip in. But if you lock the wheel cylinder in place with uh, something like a rigid nut that would just about fit in, you can lock it, push in the clip and you're done. As always, it took me a bit of time to figure it out on, the, on one side. And once I went onto the second wheel, it clipped in much faster. Even though I took pictures of the whole brake assembly before I took it apart, I made sure to lay all of the parts down on the floor as I took them off the, the axle. So I could have the exact idea of how they were put back together as I prepared the new parts next to the old parts and made sure that everything that I had all the parts and that I would be putting it back together in the same order. Before I installed the new parts, I cleaned the hub actually with the wire brush and, and wiped it down also with some rubbing alcohol so all the surfaces would be clean and tidy before I install brand new parts on them. The rest is actually pretty easy. Obviously it took me quite a bit longer on the first side than on the second side because it took a bit of time to figure out how to put in all the springs and, and uh, especially then position the brake shoes and clip in the last springs and then make sure everything is sits back together. For some reason it wouldn't really work right for the longest time, but uh, once I figured it out and uh, went over to the, the other side of the car, it just worked everything in a fraction of the time. So I guess experience also counts for a lot. The most important part comes now. Set the position of your brake shoes right. Firstly, you want the pedal travel to be as low as possible. So you want the brake shoes to be close to the brake drum, but not rubbing on them all the time. Meanwhile, I can prepare the brakes. I need to uh, set here the set the distance of those brake shoes correctly. I'm going to put the car in neutral and then uh, turn the, uh, the drum on the brakes. And the way you have to set it up is to be able to turn the wheel, to turn the drum. Uh, and those shoes shouldn't touch the drum, but just be close, very close to touching, to the touching point. So uh, when you actually hit the brakes, you don't have to push too hard. It just needs to be very close to the, the drum. So you have the, the shortest possible uh, pedal travel. This is ready. This is ready too. Okay, before I put the drum on, just let me show you what I did. Put a little bit of copper grease all around this uh, plate. So uh, the, uh, the drum will be sitting on this and it won't seize up. Secondly, as the brake pads on the brake shoes wear, there is the adjuster pin on the bottom of the brakes that will actually uh, adjust for the wear of the pads. But for that to work, you must use the handbrake, the emergency brake, regularly because that will only be activated by using the handbrake. If you never use the e-brake, the emergency brake or handbrake, over time as you use the car and brake, the brake pads at some point will not reach the drums. So you gotta push the uh, brake pedal all the way down, but the brake pads, the, dr the shoes will, will expand, but not enough to actually touch the, uh, the, the drums. Therefore, the rear brakes won't be of any effect at all. And neither will the handbrake. If you at some point just pull the handbrake once and park the car and maybe even, I mean, if it's in P, it's fine. 
the gearbox, the transmission will still stop the car, but the brakes, the handbrake itself, won't have any effect anymore. So if you want your rear brakes to work, be it the pedal brake or the emergency brake, you need to use the emergency brake regularly because the emergency brake is what activates the pin on the bottom of the, the brake, which will expand over time to adjust for the wear of the brake pads, thus always keeping them in the same position towards the brake drums. And when you press the brake pedal, there will be some actual friction on the brake drums. Now, this is something that also particularly may concern you if you have a kit replica, because if you go all out and uh, also build a dashboard with the lower console, traditionally the lower console will cover the emergency brake, meaning, okay, you're not going to use the emergency brake anymore. You think, no big deal, you just put the car into park and that's it, it's locked. Yes, but then over time, as I just mentioned, you will lose the effect of the rear brakes. That may or may not be a problem for you. I mean, if it's mainly a show car, who cares? The front brakes are doing the most most of the work anyways. And if you're not gonna drive it much and just load it up to a trailer and down from the trailer onto the show, fine. But if you are using also the car, maybe as a weekend driver, you may be looking into a solution where you can still access the emergency brake or relocate the emergency brake somewhere else where you can pull that one. Let's move on to the front brakes. So I live in a magic world and even though this is an American car, I have had no trouble disassembling most of the car, pretty much everything on the car with metric tools. To remove the brake calipers though, it's a different story. No matter how close a 10 millimeter is to 3 8 it's not the same. Because to remove the brake calipers, you absolutely must have a 3 8 Allen key. I tried it with a 10 millimeter with different tools, it just didn't, it just wouldn't work. So the 3 8 Allen key is the only Imperial tool I bought for this entire restoration project and it's absolute must to do the brakes. I could make this part very short in saying that there's really nothing special about restoring the single piston brake setup on this car. Just as I did with every metal part I removed from this car and reused later on, I treated the brake calipers to a session of a wire wheel and some rubbing alcohol and then I painted them gold. I bought a brand new set of brake pads and uh, springs and uh, brake rotors and some miscellaneous parts like rubber seals and metal sleeves, but let's just fast forward to the installation.
now it's time to get those brake calipers ready for installation and for this basically what you can see here is uh, over the brake pads come in here with the, the screws that holding holding the inner ones in or holding them in place but uh, what I need to do first actually is to put some silicon grease either on the parts on, on the place that will where there will be friction of the movement of the brake pad they will move in and out slightly and also put a little bit here on, on those uh, bolts so luckily though this uh, power stop brake pad kit kit uh, came with some uh, silicon brake component lubricant so I'm gonna put this one on there that's why I didn't paint this inner part I might have mentioned that before but that's the part of where, where actual the parts are gonna move where there's gonna be friction this will also avoid brake squeaking I mean there's different reasons for brakes to squeak it could be dirt also on the, the discs but uh, this is one way to eliminate or prevent brake squeaking is to put some silicon silicon grease on there this one again make sure to have clean gloves clean-ish this way obviously once I bolt this to the the spindle I'm gonna have to take those bolts out again but that's okay install them once the the springs, the coil springs are back in. Yep, gonna do the second one. Obviously I also bought some inner and outer bearings, new bearings for the brake motors. And the installation is actually quite simple. You just have to pop out the seal on the inner side and then take out the old bearing and then when you get the new bearing basically you have to fill it up really with loads of grease i mean put a lot of grease in your hand roll the bearing through it until it, uh, until you squeeze out the, the the grease onto the other side and then you put it in and you put more grease into it now let's turn our concentration towards installing the brake rotors and the brake calipers as you can see here once you're ready just grease up the spindle really good Lots of grease here, and you can put on the rotor with the inner bearing already in, and this is already all greased up heavily, like demonstrated on here. The rotor goes on, then the outer bearing goes in, followed by this plate, and then the nut, and then we'll just bolt it down uh, in a way that we can then just put the, the cotter pin in. And also this needs to like turn freely. The brick disc has no more play. And if we're looking to hit a cotton pin is in it's a little bit more than what I actually need to put the pin in. So once everything was back together, I just had to bleed the system with fresh new DOT3 brake fluid. So some say you can also use uh, DOT4 brake fluid. I think DOT5 is, uh, is completely different, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that. I even wouldn't use DOT4 because it says DOT3 on the uh, master cylinder uh, reservoir. Just use DOT3. Well, that's it for this video. As always, you'll find all the parts and parts numbers in the description box down below.